2016, and I am outside. The tree is up. That's a Christmas tree we're in downtown Portland. And this is my little display right here. So I'm right next to a uh, flower stand. And uh, trying to do the ministry. I want to try to go back into 1 Peter chapter 3, um, verses 8 through 22, where Peter exhorts. Uh, Christians to be sanctified and to uh, sanctify Christ as Lord. And uh, I'm going to try to look at a couple of the verses that are in this text. Um, let's see here. I'm using that poster from uh, Matthew 3 as part of our presentation. So we're going to look at uh, 1 Peter 3 verses 8 through 12 and then 1 Peter 3 verses 13 through 22. So I try to do as much of it as possible. All right. There's a band around the corner that's playing with the trumpets. Uh, when I first got out here, they were playing, but then um, I was coming at the end of it, so right now they're not playing or else I would have recorded it. Um, I was trying to, but I wasn't able to do it. Just give me a minute here. I hope your uh, your holiday's going well. The city's kind of quiet. There's not a whole lot going on. And um, pressing lips. So anyway. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas to uh, to all of you in the Portland area. I hope uh, I hope everybody's uh, all ready to for Christmas tomorrow, which is only a couple uh, hours away. Um, I know that there are some uh, Christmas services tonight. There's usually uh, a service somewhere in the in the area. Some churches have. Midnight services. I went to one last year. I think it was the Methodist Church on um, Columbia. Uh, it was a late night. Started at 11 uh, p.m. and then it went on to uh, midnight. We, we lit candles and sang some songs and someone. It's sort of like it was very liturgical, but it was worth being there. I think there was about 10 of us, just a few people. So somewhere in the uh, area, wherever you find. Um, you know, an open door. You should go, sit, pray, and uh, just be reminded of the Christmas story of God with us. Our God coming down and uh, spending some time with us. And this is the co constant reminder. Uh, we try to remind you as Christians, individual Christians in churches, we try to remind you whether, um, whether it's at Christmas time or throughout the year, that God is worthy of your time to read His Word. God is worthy of your time to pay attention to what He is communicating to you in His Gospel. <laughs> and Christmas is probably the best time to uh, to take the time to read the Gospels. You know, the Gospels of Matthew and uh, the Gospels of Mark and the Gospels of Luke and uh, the Gospels of John. But the two Gospels that records his birth is Matthew and Luke. I want to take a minute and, and, and read a chapter from Matthew and then maybe a, a, a chapter from Luke. In Matthew's Gospel, Matthew writes and says this, 
Now the birth of Jesus Christ, beginning in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. Let me go ahead and pray um, so that God bless the reading of his word. So those of you who have not yet accepted Jesus as Lord would receive him and believe his gospel. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bless the people of Portland as they hear this gospel being read and uh, that they would repent of their sin and receive your son as Lord and Savior this Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. So Matthew writes and he says this, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came to together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. So it was not the, it was not the seed of a man that impregnated her, but it was the seed of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, it says, And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife. But she kept, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. In chapter 2, the scripture says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophets. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts and gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. In verse 13, the, country, the, the, the story continues. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night, and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken 
by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Amen. Verse 16 of Matthew 10, of Matthew 2, says this. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because there were no more. But when Herod had died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, he shall be called the Nazarene. I'm sure you've all seen the movie Jesus of Nazareth. It is because he was a Nazarene. The scriptures tell us in Matthew chapter 3, Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair, and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. When Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea, and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, as they confessed their sins, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourself, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time. For in all, for in this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus went up by the Spirit into the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live 
on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Verse seven, Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death upon them a light dawn. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now as Jesus walking, was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they were, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Verses 23, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea from beyond the Jordan. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountains and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become salt, has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a, on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under the, a, a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. 
I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called list in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Blessed be the reading of the word of God. In the last couple of months, we've been doing a series on 1 Peter. Today is December 24th, 2016. Christmas Eve, the day before we Christians celebrate, and the world celebrate the birth of Messiah. I just read you Matthew chapter 1, 18, through Matthew chapter 5, 20. That is the story of the Christ. His birth was miraculous. And upon his birth, he had to leave and go to Egypt for a period of time until Herod, who sought his life, um, Herod, who sought to kill him, was dead. After the death of Herod, he was brought back to live in Nazareth. He is called Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem. We also see the baptism of John the Baptist, his cousin. Now the story of John the Baptist is in the Gospel of Luke. And you can read it in the first chapter, which is accompanied again by the gospel, by the gospel presentation of Jesus' birth, another account where the angels uh, announced his birth, and Mary gives birth to the child, and the Magi comes and brings gold and myrrh and frankincense. We know that the story of the Christ continues in the fact that he was baptized by John the Baptist, and upon his baptism he began to preach the gospel calling his generation to repent of their sins. That was the reason why God had sent him into the world. It was to call humanity to a right relationship with God by faith. Man up, till, up until that time had no faith in God. Man up until that time had no relationship with God except for Israel who had been under the first covenant. And it was not only the covenant of circumcision, but they also had to sacrifice bulls and goats and animals for the atonement of their sin. When Christ comes into the picture, he becomes the final sacrifice, he becomes the final atonement, but we don't see that until the end of his life. When we read in the Gospel just a few minutes ago, we saw that he preached the Beatitudes. He called disciples to come and follow him. He made some correction in their thinking based on what he taught to them. For the last several weeks, we've been teaching out of the Gospel, which is in the New Testament epistle of 1 Peter. We have so far taught on, on chapters 1, verses 3, uh, all the way to chapters 3, verses 1 through 7. Why are we teaching out of Peter? Peter was one of the first disciples that were called to follow him. He was called Simon. He was a fisherman. And he also had a brother that he fished along with. There was also John, another apostle, another disciple, who had a brother that he fished with. So there were four fishermen out of the group. So these men followed after the Christ. And these men not only followed after the Christ, but they continued his ministry. The ministry of preaching, healing the sick, raising the dead, and doing the things that Christ himself had come to do, which was what was not in our world. So before Christ, there was not a prophet from God who demonstrated those powers, who taught those things, who addressed the issue of repentance, who addressed the issue of sin, who brought it to man's attention that if they don't repent of sin, there will be consequences from God. Up until that time, people did whatever they wanted, practiced whatever religion, God sent his son to make that correction, to offer man a hand of reconciliation, to offer man a hand of salvation, to say to man, I have something against you, what I have against you is sin, and the sin that you carry in your heart, and that you carry out throughout your lifetime, I am going to judge, I'm going to judge it eternally. I have turned you over to a life of sin, but now I'm asking you to repent of that sin, to be reconciled to me through my son. Peter was one of those men who had reconciled himself, accepted the gospel of Jesus, and 
as a matter of fact, continue to preach the gospel that Jesus had given the disciples to preach. And the letter that I've read from several times uh, since probably the beginning of uh, the end of October, I think it was October 31st, Halloween, when we started uh, First Peter. Um, we saw that in First Peter chapter one, verses one through twenty-five, Peter addressing the issues of hope, holiness, godliness. Uh, trials, warning the Christians and calling Christians to love. So Peter continues the ministry that Christ uh, started. Peter, uh, uh, basically, after uh, many, many years of following Christ and serving Him upon His absence, after He had ascended to the heavens, writes a letter to the churches in uh, Asia Minor, which we call Turkey today. And this is the letter that he writes. He writes two letters to encourage the church. To, to strengthen the church because the church was under persecution as a result of their faith in believing in Christ. If they had not believed in Christ, if they had not taken him by faith, even though in his absence they continued to practice uh, the Christian faith, they continued to believe in his name like many churches do today. You know, like I said at the beginning of the sermon, uh, last year I spent Christmas Eve at a church, I think a Methodist church on Columbia, where they were having a night service. So the church continued believing throughout the ages as we do today. So Peter, in the first chapter, addresses the issue of hope, holiness, godliness, trials, and warns and calls Christians to love. In chapter 2 of his epistle, verses 1 through 25, Peter reminds, charges, exhorts, and calls Christians to follow Christ example follow Christ's example will you follow Christ's example or will you oppose Christ's example that was the challenge that Peter posed to the church in the first century this is the challenge that God poses to all America today will we follow in the footsteps of Christ and obey God's Word obey authority submit to authority or will we challenge God's Word challenge the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, challenge the ministry of the scriptures, and tell God we're not going to obey you, we're not going to do what you say, we're going to do whatever we want to do. We're Americans, we're rich, we're strong. You got to remember, we come from settlership, right? Slavery, settlership. Uh, there was a time when America didn't have a Pioneer Square. There was a time when America didn't have uh, these buildings here. So it took generations upon generations of men, women being born into this world and God giving them wisdom and God giving them strength on how to use the materials, you know, from the mountains and from uh, foreign countries to put this park here, to put this city here. Cities are not built overnight. It is done by God. The builder of all things is God, says the book of Hebrews. The creator of all creation, the creator of all man is God. And God wants us not only to worship him, but to build on his behalf. Remember, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It will not prevail against his church. He has the keys. He gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter. Now, not only did he give the keys, but he also gave his Holy Spirit to Peter and to the uh, other ten apostles that followed in his absence. So today in the 21st century, we have an opportunity to read the gospel and to read the epistle that his disciple had written. The gospel is about his life. The epistle is a continuation of the gospel. The epistle doesn't give you a whole lot of history, but the epistle gives you the setting of what took place. Right? The epistle gives you a, a, a setting of what took place uh, in the lives of the Christians of the first century. That they endured persecution, that they endured suffering, that they endured maltreatment and hatred. For what purpose and for what reason? Because man in their sin did not want God to have a voice. They did not want God to have a word. In other words, God doesn't get to say whatever he wants to say. Uh, through his apostles. They killed his son and called his son uh, as a servant of Beelzebub. What do we call Jesus today? Some people still call Jesus a nutcase because of the fact that he preached the gospel, because he offered his life as a sacrifice for sin. Some people still believe that the Christ uh, is in wrong for what he had preached, for he had de declared himself to be equal to God. 
He himself said, I and the Father are one. People from the Jewish tribe still believe that Jesus was in the wrong for doing that. They don't believe him as Messiah. Uh, some of the Jews still practice, uh, probably still practice, uh, offering the blood sacrifices of animals uh, for the atonement of their sins. Instead of the uh, new covenant, they're still practicing the old covenant, not believing that the Christ really was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. A son shall be born to us, uh, and the government shall rest on his shoulders, as it is written in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 9, and then Isaiah chapter 53, which summarizes the suffering servant, which is what Christ fulfilled. We also see in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, Peter exhorting those Christians, um, exhorts their suffering, um, the suffering saints, the wives and the husbands of the Christians to be sanctified and to have a sanctified life in Christ. Peter really talks to three different groups uh, in the first three chapters, three or four different groups. He talks to new Christians and tells them to long for the pure milk of the word, that is the Old Testament, so that by it they may grow in respect to salvation. Peter then tells uh, the, the Christians to submit to those who are in authority when you read uh, the, the second chapter and then when you come to the third chapter he addresses uh, husbands and he addresses wives the wife is to submit to her husband and the husband is to love his wife and care for his wife In verse 7 of uh, chapter 3, he says, uh, You husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. So the warning to the Christian husband is make sure you live in an understanding way. Paul, as I've mentioned in, in the last couple of weeks, is um, also encouraged and believes that it is the duty of the wife to submit to her husband and it is the responsibility of the husband, Christian husbands, to love their wives as Christ loved the church. So the picture of Christ and the church, which is, which is sort of a marital relationship, Christ being the husband and the church being the wife, it's sort of like a mirror image. The husband, the Christian husband, when he takes on a Christian wife, he, he compares the two relationships. So husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved his church. The same way Jesus sacrificed himself for the church, the same way Jesus loved them to death, so must the wife love her husband. A person, two people having sex is not necessarily considered husband and wife. Not if one is not in agreement with the sex that's being done. A man raping a woman cannot say that is my wife. A woman molesting a boy cannot say that is my husband. That is not the, the, the picture here that Christ is posing. So it, there has to be an agreement. There has to be submission between husband and wife. There has to be a, a, a literal marital a ceremony certificate between the two people. In other words, one is not, um, there can't be a gag in the mouth of the one as and, and for the other one to, to, to just say, that's my wife because I'm having sex with her and she's basically knocked out of sleep in a bed somewhere and she has no say so about the sex that's being taken from, the, from her body. That's not what the apostle is talking about here. It's talking about two people who are in love with each other who have come into agreement with one another. It's not, it's not a one-way situation where one person is um, implementing sex on the, on the other person. So you have to understand what Peter is talking about here too to the members of the church in Asia Minor. And he's not just talking to one, one city, he's talking to five different vicinities and cities. As Peter had written this letter, so Paul had many uh, had written many letters to the church of Ephesus, to the church of Colossae, uh, Philippi. Different churches had gotten that same message out of Paul that Peter is now preaching to these people. So we come to the, the chapter three. So we come to chapter three of Peter, and. Um, And what do we see in Peter? We see the exhortation continue, right? 
We see Peter exhorting Christians to be sanctified and to sanctify Christ as Lord. In this generation, is it any different? Christians, those of you who believe in your heart, you who are God-fearing and are married and who have a relationship with God, the call to Christian sanctification is still applicable to today. Christ being sanctified in our hearts is still applicable today. Understand what Peter is saying here is that we are to be sanctified Christians, set apart from sin, but we are also to sanctify Christ as Lord of our hearts. We are to be set apart from living like the rest of society. We're called to be a holy people, a holy nation, a people after God's own heart. God is saying, come out from among them. Come out and be free of their sin. In other words, don't be like your neighbor, the Gentile, the unbeliever who refuses to honor me as God. Don't be like the man who practices the immoralities that I have condemned him to practice because if you do, the judgment is unfortunately hell. Nobody likes to preach about hell because it's a, it's a damning and a condemning uh, a, a message. But what do you tell the person who's committing a criminal act? Right? A woman kills five of her children by drowning. What do you say to her? Let's go have a party. A man who rapes his, his, his daughter. What do you say to him? Hey, let's go watch a movie. A, a, a woman who shoots her husband to death. What do you say to her? Let's go shopping. No, when a person commits a crime, whether it be murder or rape or, you know, killing someone, you don't pat them on the back and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You, you take them to court and you justly judge them for the sin or for whatever evil that they're doing, right? You don't sit there and allow the person to commit such wicked acts without judging or without carrying justice against uh, what they had done because of the lives that have been lost, because of the people that have been offended, because of the murder that have been committed. You don't just allow the thief to just go free with all the money that's in the bank. You don't allow the person who murders someone to just go free and sit in the jailhouse, right? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The scripture says in Genesis, uh, in Genesis chapter 9, right? In, in Genesis chapter 9, the scripture says that when a man sheds the blood of another, that by his own, by man, his blood shall be shed. We have to give that back when an act of murder is committed. So we come to the gospel and we read about the story of Jesus, but then we see the continuation of it through the epistles that the, that the disciples had written, that the apostles had written. We see that it continued, it didn't stop. And throughout the ages, God made sure that his spirit was in those disciples so that they would continue preaching the gospel. It wasn't a one-time thing, and then that said, Jesus dies, hands folded, we just continue living as heathens. No, the continuation is that for God wants man to be reconciled to him, to be saved. God doesn't want to send you to hell. That's why the government has warning signs everywhere. That's why the government allows court cases to be uploaded into the television scene. So you can see that judgments are being rendered to those who commit evil. So the church is called, not only in the first century, but also in this generation and throughout the ages, to be sanctified, to be set apart from sin, from evil. Don't listen to the voice of the devil when he's telling you to kill, when he's telling you to steal, when he's telling you to rob, when he's telling you to murder, when he's telling you to rape, when he's telling you to do the evil things that you do. Mothers, it is not your job to have sex with your sons. Fathers, it is not your job to have sex with your daughters. Mothers, do not rape your sons and consider your sons to be a husband. That is evil doing. Fathers, do not rape your daughters and tell them that I am your husband. That is incest in the family. And we see in Leviticus that God forbids such things. So God called the Christians to live separately, come out from among them and live a sanctified life. A life without those sins, without the life of a mass CC, without the life of homosexuality, without the life of fornication. If you're offended, it is the spirit of God that offends you by calling you to a righteous way of living not an immoral way of living. God is not here to tell you, you know, you, you can be liberal and live however you want to live in, in His sight. God sits in heaven and He has to watch everything that you do. He has to listen to everything that you say. He has to read your heart and know that there is evil against another person or an evil against Him. 
God is not going to put you in the world and allow you to live however you want to live and not bring your thoughts, your actions, your desires, your evil doing, parents, children, people of this nation and all nations without calling you to repentance, without calling you to sanctification. God with us is not a party time. Oh, yay, God is with us. It's time for us to party. Yay, God is here. Jesus, let's give gifts. No, it's a serious matter that God had to come down to become a man and to die on the cross. The death of a cross is painful. 39 lashes to, to a man's back is painful. It rips your back open. If you've ever seen the, 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 uh, the movie done by uh, The Passion, I mean, it is such a bloody scene what the Messiah goes through. And it's so painful. A needle is painful to the foot. I get a needle to the foot every single night that I'm assaulted sexually. Okay? I mean, I'm not telling you this just off the top of my head. I'm telling you because I'm enduring the pain myself. But I'm saying if a needle is painful, how much more a nail that you drive through the foot? How much more the nail that you drive through the hand? And the whole Christmas thing, you know, it's like it's yay Jesus and the baby Jesus and hallelujah, you know, Mary and the baby. Uh, there's a serious part to it where God is here not for us to have all these festivities but to deal with the issue of sin, to deal with the issue of salvation, to deal with your heart being reconciled to God. That's why the Apostle Paul says, be reconciled to God. That's why Peter says, you need to be sanctified in Christ. It's a serious matter that God has with you and I. It's not a joking matter. It's not a, let's put up a Christmas tree and Santa Claus and hallelujah and all of that. We've got to push all of that aside and deal with the sin issue that God has with you and I. So Peter writes this letter and to continue the work of the Messiah. And Peter says this to the church in Asia Minor. He says to sum, to sum up in verses 8 through 12, Peter encourages all Christians that they must be unified. They must be compassionate. They must be kind, affectionate, and humble, blessing others, inheritors of a blessing, not insulters of those who insult. Listen to what Peter is saying to you, church. You in this generation, as well as throughout the ages, beginning in the first century. Peter says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Peter says to the church, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Peter says in verse 11, he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Here we are at Christmas time. Earlier today, I watched an escape, the story of a family completely destroyed by evil, the evil of the mother toward the children. How can we at Christmas not tell our children the story of Jesus? How can we at Christmas not tell our loved ones to repent of their sins, Christians? You who believe, you who have faith, you who go to church Sunday after Sunday, you who put money in the tithing basket, you who own a Bible and who read it, you who hold the Christianity in your heart at work and everywhere you go, but you refuse to let them know that's who you are because you're so afraid to live by faith, because you're so afraid that if they find out you might get fired from your job. 
That is the whole purpose of us being called to come out from among them. Not, to, not so that we become like they are. Peter says, you've been called for this very purpose. To follow in his footsteps. To do as he has done. This is a temporary setting. This is an introduction to all of creation in life. The time that you have here is only for a short period of time. 50 years is nothing. 70 years is nothing. 100 years is nothing in comparison to an eternity in hell. So God is introducing himself to humanity when he gives you life. He's introducing himself to humanity, to you and to I. So Peter encourages the church and talking to them, not just to husband or to wives, but he says summing it all up to all of us, right, who are in Asia Minor, all of us who are in the world, you Christians who are in the world and who are also in the fellowship of the saints. You need to be harmonious, you need to be sympathetic, you need to, see, you need to be brotherly, you need to be kind-hearted, you need to be humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. I have a, tr I ha I, this is so hard for me. I live in a, in a place where I'm insulted every day. I, 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 I endure that, that, you know, what these people are enduring. And it is so hard for me not to let out a curse word and to say F you to the woman who molests me. F you to the man who abuses me and cuts me and leaves me in pain or in blood. It's so hard to obey what Peter is saying here. It is so difficult to obey it because we are flesh. We are flesh and blood and we don't want to be harmonious. We don't want to be sympathetic. We don't want not to return insult for insult because it is pain to our flesh. It is pain to our spirit. It is pain to our souls that people insult us because of what, who we believe in and because of what we believe in. It is difficult, but God calls us to prayer and God calls us to trust in Him no matter what. When you continue reading Peter's words, verses 13 through 22, again, Peter is talking to all the Christians, not just the husbands and the wives and the new Christians and to those who are servants serving their masters and to be submissive to them. But now he's talking to the whole house, all the Christians. And he tells them in verses 13 through 22, all Christians exhorted, they're being exhorted to suffer without fear without trouble. Instead, they're to sanctify Christ, to sanctify His Lordship. He tells them to defend the faith. Because there will be an account for it. He tells them to keep a good conscience because Christ died Christ went and preached to the dead resurrected and now sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Where is Guy and Gabriel Franklin today? Are they in heaven with God? Or are they hiding in the community waiting for me to go to sleep to judge me for this message like they did last night? Why is it that they're not in the church? But everybody in America wants to represent them. Every man with a long chin wants to be a Guy Franklin. Every woman with a bun in her head wants to be a Gabriel. Why is it that they don't want to be Christians? Is it our hypocrisy or is it their lack of desire to be holy? Or is it because they don't want to be reconciled to God? 
Why is it that the Franklins don't want to be reconciled to God? Years after years, they've been called to repent. Why is it that the Franklins don't want to repent? Why is it that this woman is still being hidden in the background with her husband, Andre, and she refuses to repent of her sin? How many more people in her family have to die because of her sexual sins? Because she is being coaxed by the gay community or the Klan to commit those sins. Protecting MacArthur in his sins. Is he living a sanctified life in Christ? Or is he one of the gay leaders of this country? And for that reason, he is honored, respected, upheld by so many of you. When are these people that I've made mention of going to obey what Peter has said here in the gospel and then also in the epistle? Why is that there is no harmony with Grace Community Church, a church that has been in existence for what, 60 years? You mean to tell me I can't call Grace and say Merry Christmas and yet they're preaching the gospel, expositing the scriptures and they've got a MacArthur Bible study out? And they've got commentaries out. They've got grace to you, master's college, master's seminary, and yet I can't pick up the phone and say Merry Christmas, John. I can't pick up the phone and say Merry Christmas, Gabriel, because these people are still living as if they're heathens and being protected by the community in the back. You mean to tell me these people, after 20 years of preaching this gospel, still don't want to make it right with God or right with me? but instead they want to threaten my life and put me in danger. Where is the repentance? How many other Christian leaders are living this hypocritical life? Imagine Peter, after writing this letter, going out and living the complete opposite of what he's written. How sad it would be for the church if after we preach the gospel, we don't check ourselves and we go on sinning. So we see in 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 7, Peter exhorts suffering saints as wives and husbands and Christians to be sanctified and to sanctify Christ as Lord in their hearts. When you read when you read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 and on, Peter says, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Why would a person want to trouble a Christian if the Christian's desire, all his desire is to do, is to be, is to tell you to be reconciled to God before you die and go to hell? If somebody's going to give me a warning so that I'm saved from a fire, hey, don't go across the street, there's a bomb that's about to go off, and you say, get off of me, man, I don't want your religious warning, and you go across the street, the bomb goes off and you die. Well, I did warn you. You didn't want to believe and you thought I was just being religious, you know? Where did the tree come from, if not the hand of God, right? Where did these shrubs come from, if not the hand of God? Where does the water and the seed for coffee come from? And, and sugar and milk out of the cow come from, if it's not from the hand of God? Cannot that God send his son to warn you of his acts? Imagine if the people of Haiti, right? If the people of Haiti had been warned that there was a, an earthquake coming for 7.0, they at least would have been prepared. But there was no preparation. 300,000 people, they say, have died. Imagine if we were warned before 9-11 came, right? We would, have, we would have removed all of those people out of the building. What about the people in the Midwest if they were warned that there was coming a flood and they needed to leave their homes? What about California? Every time there's a fire, if there was a warning, there's going to be a fire in this area, a mudslide. Imagine how important warnings become that can save your life. That's why you've got so many uh, posters and, and signs up. It's to tell people, to inform people, to warn people that 
is what this gospel is, people. It is a warning from God. It's an encouragement from God. Don't take it lightly. Anytime you hear the gospel, listen to what God is communicating to you. It applies to your life in Christ Jesus and outside of Christ Jesus. In the Christian faith and outside of the Christian faith. For this life, God calls you to be godly and for the life to come. We're not just here as a piece of flesh, die and then that's it. Your spirit has to continue somewhere. It's not just about your flesh, it's also about your spirit. Verse 15 of 1 Peter 3, he says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in, in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile you, or those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Verse 17, for it is better if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. Verse 18, he says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. God saw, or Christ saw, the importance of the gospel, that when he died, where do you think Jesus went? When he died, he went to preach to those who were taken captive in prison. The body and the spirit is separated. When you read Luke 16, the scripture says that the man was in Hades. So Jesus probably went to Hades. Because remember on the cross he said to, to, the, to, the, to the thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. So he went to paradise, but he also went to Hades to preach salvation to those who were what? Who were under God's judgment. When you die, folks, you either go to paradise to be with Jesus and the thief on the cross, or you go and be with Hades with the rich man. I don't know which side you're on. I don't know which side you're going to. But I hope you take this warning seriously, because you and I are not here forever. If a mother can draw on her children, any man and any woman can pull out a revolver and shoot any of us at any moment at any time. It happened at Clackamas Mall just not too long ago. It happened to a church back east in the Carolinas last year, I think it was. I mean, out of nowhere, somebody comes and just shoots nine folks. I mean, well, death comes, you know, Genesis 2.17, anytime you are at a funeral, it is the promise of God that's being fulfilled in that human's life. In that, hu in that human's life, it is the promise of God that's being fulfilled. In Genesis 2.17, you shall surely die. So every time you see a funeral, every time you see some somebody being buried, it is the promise of God. You see, we weep at the fact that someone pulls out a revolver. We weep at the fact that a, a, a woman would drown. We weep at how they die, but we don't think about the fact that it was God's promise in Genesis 2.17. It was his promise. He says, you shall surely die because of sin. And before you die, I want to make sure that not only your flesh, but also your soul doesn't go to hell. So I'm going to send you my son at Christmas so that you don't go to that place called hell, that place of torment. Officers kill criminals, African Americans, people that are guilty all the time. But it's not just the killing. It's where the soul and the spirit goes. It's not just the fact that the revolver was pulled and somebody killed somebody. We know that's going to happen anyway. Right? Whether it be the officer or whether it be sickness or whether it be diseases. It, it, it's not how they die. It's the fact that God's promise of death will be fulfilled. It's the fact that God's promise is going to be fulfilled. And the promise is you shall surely die. I shall surely die. Your family shall surely die. And God is taking precautions before that time of death and saying, before you die, make it right with me. Be reconciled with me. Before you die, make that reconciliation decision. Before you die, 
you're gonna die anyway. It's not how they die. It's the fact that they will die to fulfill God's promise and then either go to paradise to be with the thief that was on the cross or to be with Hades, to be in Hades with the who? To be in Hades with the rich man who refused to humble himself before God. So when Peter writes this epistle here to continue the message of the gospel to the church that had risen up after Christ had been crucified, resurrected and ascended, he encourages them in the beginning of the epistle and he says, you loved him even though you did not see him. You believed in him even though you were not there. And that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to submit to those who are in authority. And when they persecute you, believe even more, pray even more. Preach even more. Live for him even more. Show those unbelieving, disobedient brothers of ours that God wants to be reconciled to, to them. So, we see here in 1 Peter that Jesus went to where? To the place of torment. He went to talk to them upon his death. He didn't just lay in the cave and do nothing. He went up to heaven to prepare, to present himself. He went to heaven to present himself before the Father. When you read Hebrews, he was the final propitiation. So he probably went up there to present himself before the Father. You know, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, in the book of Hebrews, right, that the Jews presented uh, before God goats and bulls and animals, and then killed the animal and used the blood as, you know, the blood sacrifice as atonement for sin. Well, Christ died, where did he go? He probably went up to heaven to present himself, his body, his blood, as a sacrifice for sin. He went to hell to preach so that they could be saved. He went to what? Paradise. Not only to drop off the thief, but also probably to visit other Christians. Christians that he was going to resurrect. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, the scripture says that what? Upon his resurrection, many Christians came back to life. So the death of Christ wasn't just, oh, he died on the cross, but look at all the activities. Look at where he went, to the places that he went, in the spirit realm. Heaven, where he went in the spirit realm. Paradise, where he went in the spirit realm. Um, Hades, where he went in the spirit realm. And the place where, where those people that were held for a period of time, but then they resurrected with him, those who believe. Christians. And they walked around Jerusalem, revisiting their families. So Jesus' death on the cross wasn't just another dead Jew. It was all the spiritual activities that took place afterward and during that three-day period when he was where? Where he was in the cave and his spirit was somewhere else, fulfilling the promises of the prophets. So in verse 19, the scripture says that in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God, for a conscience, for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Angels and authorities. Do we see angels down here? The scripture says in Hebrews that we entertain angels. We don't know what angels look like. They may look like us, man. Remember in the Old, in the Old Testament that Abraham got a visit from God and two angels and they look like men. Mere men walking among us. We don't know what they look like. They don't have to have wings. They look like men. When you read the resurrection, the scripture says that there were men in shining clothes standing there waiting for the women to come. And says, what are you doing here? He says, he's already resurrected. Go and tell his brethren. So this, so this Christmas, no cigarettes, sorry. So, this Christmas, it's not just another Christmas. If you're going to get anything out of this Christmas, let it be the gospel. Let it be the message of your salvation. Not your daughter's salvation, your son's salvation, your grandmother's salvation, your children's salvation, your salvation. You, 
being the image of God. Remember the scripture says he created, he created the male and female. That means you individually will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the life that you've lived on the earth. It's not your friends or your boyfriend, your, your husband, your best friend. No, you. You who stand and walk on the face of the earth. You who have been given individual time. When you came out of the belly, Merry Christmas, God bless you. You who have been given an individual gospel message and opportunity to reconcile with God through repentance and believing in Christ. This Christmas, let it not be just another Christmas, but let it be one where your life changes, where you exercise faith in God, where you exercise faith and believe. How serious do you think God was when he said, let there be light? Look around you, how real is human, is human life on earth? How real is human life on earth, people? We have oxygen that we cannot see. Feel. We breathe. The earth hangs on nothing. Outside of the earth's atmosphere is nothing but darkness and stars. The sun and the moon, galaxies, we only see at night. How serious do you think God is about creation? How serious is death? How much do you weep when your loved ones are pronounced dead? Because you know you'll never see that person again. That's how serious God is about your salvation. That he would come in the form of a man. So this baby, God with us. Imagine God walking among us, living among us, living in us. It wasn't just God with us, God in us. The message wasn't just Jesus walking among us in the first century, but it's the Spirit. The third person of the triune Godhead living in us. Continuing the ministry of reconciliation. Continuing the ministry of your salvation. Continuing the ministry of forgiving you of sins you've committed. I've committed. We've committed. Past sins. Present sins. Sins that haven't even been committed yet. That we will commit in 2017. Sins that we will engaged in where our hands are going to be filled with blood wars that are coming death certificates that haven't even been written yet evil that hasn't even been done yet thought through isn't it armageddon coming isn't there a a a a, a, a rapture coming isn't there a uh i mean how much is coming the man of lawlessness is coming War is coming. Eternal damnation is coming where the scripture says the moon is going to be like blood or the, the sun is going to be... When you read it in, 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 in the book in, in, in Matthew and Revelation, what is it that God has coming? He says, you better be on your P's and Q's. You've been warned. Receive God with us. And when you receive God with us, you will receive God in us. If you don't receive God with us, which is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the baby in that manger, neither will you receive God in us. If you don't receive God with, you are not going to receive God in. And what, is, and, what does, and what does he say about the scripture? And what does he say about the scriptures? For the scriptures testify of me. You need a copy of the scriptures. Get that copy, read that copy, love that copy. Use that copy to raise your children. Use that copy to minister to each other as husband and wife. If you haven't been reconciled to God, what better time during the course of the year to be reconciled with your God if not is his birthday? Let it be your birthday present to him when you say, I believe in you. I trust in you. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. So today I... Uh, as you know, I'm out here trying to build a household of faith, plan a church, and I'm not making any success. I don't know if it's me, the preacher, or if it's you, the reluctant unbelievers, or the believers who just say, no, you don't have that level, or you're not European, or whatever the issue is in your heart to say, well, we're not giving you a church, or blah, 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 blah. But bottom line is, I wanted to let you know that so far, $11 were given, okay, 11 bucks. 
So you can see how much Portland really wants the church to be built, right? A property to be purchased, right? I mean, how expensive are these things? More than 1100 These things cost millions, you know? And they remain for hundreds of years. So the Lord says, you know, you can give if you choose to. Now they really don't like me asking for money on this on this plaza here on this on this on this park. But you know, when you see me out there in the street corners, remember the messages. Remember what God has related to you. And don't be afraid to give more than a dollar. Don't be afraid to give more than ten. You know, ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred. I think God is worthy of our money. Right? If that's the only thing we can give in response to what he's done for us in life, don't be shy. You know, it's a personal decision. Just like your salvation is that personal decision. Don't be afraid to give. Right? Today is your day of salvation if you receive this gospel. And um And I would tell you to uh you know, don't let your Christmas be just a Christmas tree, right? Don't let your Christmas be just a Christmas tree. Let your Christmas be about the birth of, 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 of Jesus. Now that you understand who he is, why he came, what he's accomplished, and what he intends to do, and what he did do. It was read to you. It was preached to you. And I challenge you to buy yourself a Bible, you know, and make it right with God, with the Christ, you know, with Christmas comes a Bible. With Christmas comes a Bible. A New Testament, an Old Testament copy. A message of salvation. With Jesus comes, it's not just a manger, but it's the whole book. You know, God throws the book at you and says, go buy my book, read it from cover to cover, and do as I say, so you can be saved. If you want to be saved, you simply have to pray. Father, I repent of my sins. Father, I repent of my evil doing for the last 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. Father, I repent of my unbelief. I give my life to you this Christmas, 2016. I repent of my sin. I want to receive your Holy Spirit. You don't need me to do it. You can do it yourselves at home or right where you're standing or sitting. I repent. Please bless me with your Holy Spirit. I don't want to live, uh, you know, another day without knowing the real you by faith. It begins by faith. It remains in faith. Amen. And when you've made that decision and you've gone in that direction with your God, what else can you do? You can buy yourself a copy of the Old and New Testament scriptures. You can join a New Testament church. You can get baptized. These are the things that you can do to help yourself this Christmas. I want to end this message, but not end the ministry. Father, I pray for Portland, Oregon, and I pray for the people of Portland, that they would take you seriously and um, not oppose your message to them. Pray that you would work out their salvation or help them work out their salvation with fear and trembling. And that they would uh, turn to you this Christmas, take you at your word, and move forward with their lives in your direction. Pray that many will come to salvation and many will believe. May you forgive me for my sins, and I pray for the salvation of those who oppose me out of the Franklin family household and out of Grace Community Church of Sun Valley. Pray that they would repent, John and his staff, that they would repent um, the people of the Cal State University Northridge Bible Study. Pray that they would repent and stop sitting behind closed doors and stop living in the darkness and come to the light, the light of Christ. 
I pray for the gay community that they would be saved out of that lifestyle. I pray for the government that the government would stop warring against nations who don't want to subordinate themselves to them. I pray for the claim that they take off that hat and reveal to the world who they are and repent of the hate that's in their hearts. I pray for the black community that they would be free. I pray for the nations of the world that this Christmas would be a Christmas of change. In Jesus' name, amen.